Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. He's here now already. Come on. Let him have his way. Celebrate Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Just worship him for just a few moments. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're here to let the Lord have his way. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Make it personal this morning. In whatever way he moves upon you, just worship him, adore him, rejoice, praise him, give him glory. He's been good to you. He's been good to you. He's kept you. He's blessed you. He's strengthened you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We worship you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you've done. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we love you today, and we come before you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for life. Thank you for freedom in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your keeping power. Thank you for keeping us from what we don't even know, from what we didn't even know was coming, but you protected us. Hallelujah. Thank you for the privilege to be able to come into this place today and rejoice together and worship you together, Lord. We thank you for what you did for us. We thank you for what you're doing now. And we celebrate and praise you for what is to come. Lord, we're rejoicing now for where we're going. We thank you now for what's next. We praise you now for what's next. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you for every gift. Thank you for every person. Thank you for every leader. Thank you for the musicians. Thank you for these singers. Thank you, Lord. I pray right now for a fresh anointing. We pray right now for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray now for healing in this place that as they worship, as they minister, lives will be changed. Come on, let's worship him. Come on, come on. We're not doing it the same anymore. We want his presence, his blessings. Somebody's going to be healed. Somebody's going to be delivered. Not because of us. It's the anointing that destroys the yoke. So, Lord, anoint us afresh. Cover us. Let there be a deluge, a flood of the anointing of the Spirit. Spirit all over us, Lord. Your anointing from head to toe that when we sing, when we Lord, minister, that hearts are touched and changed by the power of God. Thank you, Jesus, for every person, for every opportunity, those online and those here. We expect great things, Lord, in this place today. In the name of Jesus. And we thank you for it and we give you praise right now in Jesus' name. And somebody said, 
somebody said come on somebody said it is so
Come on, give the Lord praise this morning. Come on, give him praise and glory this morning. Hallelujah. That's a rendition of that old hymn. It's funny, I was thinking that the first time I heard that hymn was in 1989 at my grandmother's funeral. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. Anybody ever took something to the Lord in prayer? He says, you're carrying too much. Why? Because you haven't brought it to me and included me in the situation. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Give him one more hand clap of praise this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for being a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Praise the Lord. Turn around and hug a few necks and shake some hands. Welcome somebody to the house of God this morning. It makes no difference what you're going through. You're going to make it. God's going to see you through. So hold your head up. Put a smile on your face. This is another test. It won't last always. So get ready. Get ready. For your blessings. For your blessings. Get ready. Get ready. For your miracle. For your miracle. Get ready. Get ready. For your blessings. For your blessings. Get ready. Get ready. For your miracle. For your miracle. I know you've been hurting. Let me encourage you, it's gonna be all right. Trials and troubles, they come to make you strong. Keep on believing, you keep holding on. So get ready, get ready for your blessing. For your blessing. Get ready, get ready for your miracle.
Hallelujah. Anybody blessed today? Come on, give God praise. Hallelujah. Come on, celebrate him in this place today. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Late in the midnight hour. Come on. God's going to turn it around. He's going to work in your favor. Say late. Late in Thank the midnight you, Jesus. hour. God's going to turn it around. And around. And around. And around. Hallelujah. That's what faith says. God's going to turn it around. Hallelujah. Put your hands together this one. God's going to turn it around. Do you believe that today? Late in the midnight hour, God's going to turn it around. Hallelujah. 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 Bless him. David said, I will look to the hills from which cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord. Hallelujah. My, 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 my. God does a lot in the midnight hour. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Paul and Silas were praying, and at midnight, God shook the jail, and people began to get set free. David looked at his own life and said, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy will come in the morning. Anybody know what I'm talking about right there? Sometimes you had to cry all night long. Hallelujah. I got joy now. Hallelujah. And this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. And the world can't take it away. My God, my God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord if you can. Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord this morning for his goodness, his mercy, who he is. I'm going to be honest with you. I just, I'm scared to do anything right now. Because when I think about Jesus, come on, son. Hallelujah, and all that he's done for me. My soul cries, hallelujah. I'm so glad God saved me. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Good God from on high, my God, I feel the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus. He's been so good, so good to me, so good to me so good to me hallelujah 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 thank you Jesus anybody got a head glory in this spirit hey Jesus hallelujah hallelujah Thank you, Jesus. Ma, 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 ma. Well, while we're in the praising mood, Brother Gary is back and Sister Bernadette is back. Come on. That's a miracle standing over there. And what the devil meant for evil, God turned it around for good. Somebody ought to give God praise and Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's commonly for the upright to praise him. It's normal for the upright to praise him. 
In other words, this is not out of order. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. My, my, my. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Why are you so happy? Because he's been good. Is it a show? It's not a show. It's not a game. It's a real praise that comes from a broken heart. A heart that could have given up a long time ago. From a bunch of people who used to be this and used to be that. But we come together on the Lord's Day. And we put aside all of our differences. And we come together and give God a praise. Hallelujah. My God, my God. Thank you, Jesus. My Lord, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you for your love and your kindness. Thank God for everything that he's done. Come here, Brother Gary and Sister Bernadette. I don't want to overlook you guys. I want to give you an opportunity to share and just tell the saints what the Lord did. Praise the Lord. Come on, let's show him some love. I want to thank God for being here today. Thank God for each and every one of you, each and every one of your prayers and uh, cards or words of sympathy or whatever you've done. I just want to thank you for it. But uh, a week be before the year ended and a week during the first week in, in this year, I got sick. I want to tell you I got sick. I had never been that sick before in my life. I could, my wife wanted me to, I wanted to lay in the bed and just do nothing. And, and she noticed how sick I was. Thank God for a good wife. She noticed how sick I was. And she uh, encouraged me to get up and go back to the hospital. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to go. I just wanted to just lay there. When I got to the hospital, the doctors, they was glad. They was thanking her for bringing me. I'm telling you, the devil tried to take my life. And, and I thank God for prayers. I thank God for for uh, being just in my life, you know. The, you know, the doctors was there, but God was the uh, chief physician. He was the chief physician. And uh, I was, I was uh, laying there in the hospital bed. The doctors called my wife out, and they didn't think I was going to make it through the night. That's just how sick I was. You know, and she didn't tell me, of course, that the doctors didn't think I was going to make it through the night. But I know she called some people, and they started praying. And then we took our faith and added it to those prayers. People without faith, you, you got to have this faith, you know. And I appreciate God for giving me the faith, for me having the faith, you know, to go on, you know, to, to endure. But, you know, I'm not. A good, a great speaker, and then like that. But you can always talk about God. You can always speak on God's goodness and His and His mercies and His grace. And I thank God for each and every one of you. I thank God for your prayers. I thank God for my wife for being right there beside me every step of the way. You know, I thank you. Everybody sent him home. And the last time he went, 
I was trying to get him to Georgia to his doctors up there. They told me, they said, they said Miss Young, he ain't going to make it. I said, he ain't going to make it. They said, oh, he ain't going to make it to Georgia. So he said, get, they said, get him to the nearest hospital, but the best hospital. I said, I've been taking him. I, he said, well, don't bring him back. I said, okay, I won't. I had to, Gary couldn't, Gary, he couldn't walk from here to there. I had to, I had to line chairs up from my bedroom to the to my car. I had to line up chairs from, from the house to just let him walk and sit. And I finally got him to the car, and I took him to the hospital. And I said, he, he said, Jen, I don't want to go. And they called me Jen. He said, Jen, I don't want to go. I said, baby, you got to go. He said, but I don't feel like it. I said, you, he said, I don't feel like sitting. I said, you can sit. Trust me. I said, they going to keep you today. Like that. I said, I bet you they going to keep you today. I said, you ain't coming back home. I said, don't worry about it. Come on, get in the car. So we got in the car. When we got, I called my sister-in-law, and she came, Kay. And my other sister, I said, we're going to be, I said, we're going to tag team them today. Like, that's what I had already said. We got there. Gary was so sick. They had IVs all in his neck. They didn't have nowhere else to put IVs. He was on by 10 or 15 antibiotics. They said, if he, they said, thank God you got him here because he would have been dead in the morning. They had, Gary was on, Gary had pneumonia, flu, COVID, sepsis. He had 12, he had some type of, some type of rare fever. He had all kind of stuff. When we got to the hospital, they said, well, she told me, the doctor said, he ain't going to make it. She said, Miss Young, I hate to tell you, but the, your husband half dead. She said, we can do anything for him I, if we can. We may have to send him to Tupelo, but they probably ain't going to be able to do nothing for him now. I said, I'm trusting God. And that night, my sister sent me a text. She said, the Holy Ghost told her to pray that the Lord dispatch an angel in his room. Pastor, this is why I was telling you, going to blow your mind. I was in the room, <clears throat> and I was laying down because I had to wear a mask because Gary was so sick. And I said, Lord, I can't sleep in this mask, so I had my head covered so I could take the mask off. So when I took the mask, when I got up, it was about 3 o'clock in the morning. That's why I was praising so when y'all said in, late in the midnight hour, God, I turned it around. It was about 3 o'clock that morning, and <clears throat> I was in the room. And when I took the cover off my head, I saw a figure. Gary was on oxygen machine because they said they had to put him on, put him on life support, put him on a ventilator because his kidneys had started shutting down. And I, I saw a figure in his in the room. And I, I said, Lord, let me put the mask back on. I thought it was a nurse. When I woke up, the figure was gone. They was over at the oxygen. They had him on oxygen. He the per, the figure was standing on at the oxygen machine, but he was leaning over Gary, like speaking a word over him. And so I got up. Now, I know. I said, I, I, I put the mask, I looked up, but they gone. That's why I got up and I looked under the bed. I said, because I thought the nurse was bending down, dropped something, was getting it off the floor. And I looked and they was gone. So I got up and I went out in the nurse's station. And when I walked out there, she said, Miss Young, you like you saw a ghost. I said, no, I just was trying to confirm something. I said, well, you in the room about 3 o'clock this morning. She said, I came in there. She said, I can tell you exactly what time I was in there. She said, I can pull the records. She pulled his record, pulled the record. She said, I was in there at 2 o'clock. But I said, where did you go? She said, I stood on y'all side. She said, because both of y'all was sleeping. So I said, Lord, they so tired. She said, I done dropped, I did everything, making all kind of noise. And they, these folks ain't woke up yet. She said, Lord, they so tired. Just like that. I said, well, did you ever go over there by the oxygen? She said, no, I never went over there by the oxygen machine because Gary IVs all of them was over here. She said, I had to stay over because I had to draw blood, so I never went on the other side. She said, what's wrong, Miss Young? I said, I, I said, I didn't have any time with an angel. She said, what? I said, yes. So when I got, when I went back in there, I stood where the, where, where the presence of God was, and the Holy Ghost fell all over me. And I began to just praise God in the room. Gary, they, that night they were saying Gary was going to die. Gary was, his kidneys started back working. He was, they took him off. The, they started, you know, decreasing their oxygen. They started back breathing on his own and everything, I'm telling you. And I'm saying, God healed him. God came and sent an angel in that room and spoke a word over this man. God healed Gary, I'm telling you. And I, even before that, even when he was going through with the counseling, we got, Pastor, I'm losing now. One second. Uh, we was going through with finances. You know how it is. When you don't work, you don't get paid. We ain't have no money. Gary haven't worked since 2022. I was on my way to church one day. And I said, Lord, I said, now when I get to this church, I'm going to say, 
fast the story. Now you know the man ain't working, don't you? And we need some money. Like I said, I'm going to say the church need to help us. The Lord spoke to me just like he said, don't ask anybody for anything. I'm going to provide for you. From this day, ask Pastor, I ain't asked them and nobody else for nothing. And God has been providing every day, every single month, that money falling, was falling in that account. Sometimes we would have a $19 in there and looking at about $4,000 worth of bill. But, but you know what? When time to pay them, the money was there. We were never late, never dizzy, got cut off. God put that money in there every month like he was supposed to. And he always took me back to Elijah and the widow woman. God said, if I can put meal in an empty barrel, I can sustain you out of your empty account. You ain't got to worry. Just trust me. And that's what I did. I put my trust in God. And God made a way every time. Even when we were in the hospital, we ain't had no insurance, but we thought we did. The man said, the doctor said, your bill going to be about a million dollars. Guess what? We went to the hospital. Folks did the transplant. We stayed in the Hope House. We they fed us, did everything else. And when we got home, the insurance called and said, Miss Young, y'all ain't got no insurance. I said, we don't. I said, well, when did it cancel? He, when, we, when we was out, he said, y'all insurance, y'all ain't had insurance since uh, December the 31st of 2022. He said, now, how that happened? Insurance? He said, y'all don't have insurance, but it's showing insurance. He said, now, how that happened? I'll never know. I know you'll never know if you don't know Jesus and know how God will work it out for your good. I'm telling you, every, I can sit here all day and to next year this time, and I still can't tell you all the things that God has done for us. God has been so faithful to, uh, to us, and I'm so grateful for everything that he's done. You know, I mean, God has been good to us. Even now, I mean, God is blessed. We don't get enough money every month, but I'm telling you, like I said, I serve a God that owns the cattle on thousands. He, he said the earth is his, and, and, the, and the, the earth is Lord, and the fullness of everything is well in it. So, and like I, like, I ain't got to ask God, beg God. He's my father. And one thing about it, he know I need a roof over my head. He know we need transportation. He know I need to eat. If he feed the bird, he going to feed me. So, I ain't worried. I just trust God. And if he say give, I ain't got nothing, I'm going to give out of nothing. And that's all I got to say. <laughs> and I'm grateful. <laughs> Amen. Come on, somebody give God praise. Hallelujah. I know people say God doesn't work miracles anymore, but we have one right here. Come on, celebrate Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The miracle worker. And we thank God for our family, our brother, our sister, and what they've meant to us. Brother DJ, Sister Nadia, come on, stand up here right quick. Let's celebrate. Come on, let's celebrate these newlyweds. <laughs> this is our new couple. They've been honeymooning. And this is our new sister in the Lord, Sister Nadia. Come on, let's give God praise. Welcome home. God bless you guys. We thank God for them, and we thank God for everyone. Would you remain standing for just a moment? I'm just going to say a prayer. Uh, if anyone is sick or if you're online and you have a need, we want to pray. The effectual fervent prayers of the righteous availeth much. So let's just take a moment to touch and agree in this place and pray for a miracle in your life, family, whoever it may be. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for the privilege of prayer. Thank you for your presence that has been here with us. Thank you for everyone that's here. Thank you, Lord, for uh, Brother Gary, Sister Bernadette, and what you've done in their life. Let their testimony, Lord, serve as encouragement for others who are battling right now. In the name of Jesus, and Lord, we give you praise for, for goodness and your mercy. We pray for healing in this room, those online, those who may watch later, who may have a need, financial, physical, emotional, whatever it is, we pray for divine healing in their body. 
in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for it right now. Even uh, as we move forward in this service with offering and everything, we pray your blessings and we ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Come on, let's give him praise for the offering. If you have something, you can drop it off. Praise the Lord. Thank you for your generosity. We thank God for visitors this morning. Let's show them some love. The Hobbs family, some friends of mine from Portia, Arkansas. This two weeks in a row we've had people from Arkansas, we thank God for you guys and uh, for the privilege of worshiping with us this morning. Amen. Mariah, come on, let's show him some love. I know we clap all the time, but ain't nothing wrong with that. the rising sun. 
middle of my trial. Oh, I'll still bless you in the middle of the road when I don't know where to go. Oh, I'll still bless you in the middle of my storm, in the middle of my trial. Oh, I'll still bless you when I'm in the middle of the road and I don't know where to go. I'll still bless you. I'll still bless you. I'll still bless you. I'll still bless you. Yes, I'll still bless you. I'll still bless you. I'll still bless you. I'll still bless you. Oh, I'll still bless you. I'll still bless you. I'll still bless you. I'll still bless you. Come on, let's give the Lord praise. He's faithful. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Seated in the presence of the Lord. Thank you, singers and musicians. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of St. John. St. John chapter 11. Good to see everyone here this morning. It's always a joy to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. St. John chapter 11, and we will jump into the reading in verse number 1. Gospel of St. John, chapter 11 and verse number 1. It says this, Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. And when Jesus heard it, he said, This sickness is not unto death. But for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. These were friends of Jesus. Yes, Jesus had friends. He actually spent time with them. He hung out at their house. Jesus believed in fellowship. Jesus loved people. He was the Son of God. He was God manifest in the flesh, but he loved people. And he took time to be with them, and they had a long-lasting relationship. Then it says, and when he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Now, the first six verses of chapter 11 are somewhat intriguing. And to be honest with you, in our human minds, they're somewhat confusing. Why? Because the Bible says 
that Jesus loved Lazarus. It doesn't say Lazarus loved Jesus, which is important. I'll get to that in just a moment. But it talks about the love Jesus has for Lazarus, which teaches us that, yes, those who the Lord loves still get sick. This common and popular word of faith doctrine in theology teaches that when you have faith, you won't get sick. When you have faith, you won't go through hardship. But that's not what the Bible teaches. In fact, those who are loved by the Lord are going to go through difficult situations. But what's unique is, because let's be real, uh, whether you're saved or you're lost, you're going to go through terrible times. The Bible says that it rains on the just as well as the unjust. When a harsh rain comes, if there is a pagan farmer who hates God, he's going to get rain too. And I know sometimes we're selfish in our theology. Well, we don't want people to be okay if they don't know Jesus. But that's just not how the Bible is. That's why the Bible says, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Because God is owed praise by people. Because God is just a good God. So what makes us different as Christians? What makes us different is we have a place that we can run to. We have an anchor that we can run to. It doesn't absolve us. It doesn't teach that we won't get hurt. We won't go through trouble. We won't go through sickness. We won't go through disease. But in the midst of those things, we can go to the Lord. And we can find peace. We can find comfort. We can find joy. We can find everything we need. The Bible says the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous. Who are the righteous? Those who've been washed in the blood. It, there's no great ones big ones, little ones, and all of those things, it's those who are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, uh, we will go through trial, we will go through situation, we will go through, uh, but we can run to the Lord, the righteous run to it and are saved. So as we look at these six verses, we also see that there was an emergency taking place. Lazarus, who was a friend of Jesus, was sick unto death. In other words, he didn't just have a common cold. It wasn't just some small situation that he was dealing with, but the sickness that he had was a critical sickness. In other words, at any moment he could go. So they needed Jesus to be there. But the Bible says something intriguing uh, it talks about how he loved Lazarus, but at the same time, knowing the emergency of the situation, Jesus still waited another two days before he left. I mean, because if you love me, why are you waiting? Come on, somebody. I need you right now. I don't need you in two days. And that's the warped mind of people. When we are in need, we want God to do it right now. I didn't say y'all, I said us. Jesus waited two more days, but he said something in the text that I'm going to use as a subject this morning that blows my mind. He says this sickness is not unto death, but Lazarus died. But Jesus, you told us he wouldn't die. Well, when you really understand the text, he really says the final outcome of this is not going to be death. In other words, it's going to look hopeless. It's going to look like there's no hope for it. But when all is said and done, to bring glory to God, he's going to die, but he's not going to stay dead. I want to talk to you for just a few moments. This sickness is not unto death. Look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, neighbor, this is not going to kill you. Would you bow your heads? Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. and We thank you for another privilege, another opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, 
for the people in the service that we've had so far. We pray for the anointing of the Spirit to rest upon us once again, the teacher and the preacher, the Holy Spirit. Help us to rightly divide the word of truth. Lord, we pray that the people are anointed as well to hear what I believe you've given us for this service, and we give you the praise and the glory, and we ask it in Jesus' name, and everyone said amen. I believe that there's no chapter in the Bible that shows the humanity of Christ like St. John chapter 11. We realize in biblical theology, Christianity, uh, that Jesus Christ is God. Amen, somebody. But he is God manifest in the flesh. So being that he is God, but at the same time, he's man. Now, don't get tripped up over that. Just believe it. Because sometimes I think we try to get too technical in our theology and we think we have the perfect explanation. That's why faith is important to Christians. Because we believe things that are humanly impossible. Because how can the Bible say the Lord our God is one God, but yet there be three persons in the Godhead? I, 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 my human mind can't fathom that because how can three be one? Well, they can be one in unison, in unity, uh, but there are three distinct persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And if you read John chapter 11, I believe it gives us clear indication of the triune Godhead because Jesus is praying to the Father and he shows distinction, we'll get to it, between him and the Father. And he says, you sent me. He didn't say, I sent me. He says, Father, you sent me. And so as you study St. John chapter 11, you see in the book of John within itself that Jesus is God. The Bible says in John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we see that. The, the Bible says in St. John 1, 14, and the word was made flesh. This is what we call the incarnation. In other words, God became man. God is a spirit. You can't see him. You can't behold him. That's why Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He didn't say, I am the Father. He says, but I embody the essence of the Father. Everything that the Father has and is was in the person of Christ. The uh, Colossians in chapter 2 says the fullness of the Godhead bodily dwells in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 2, start at verse 5. The Bible tells us that Jesus thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He was God, but he laid aside, if we can say it this way, the expression of his deity. He never ceased to be God. He never stopped being God. But as God, he couldn't die. But as a man, he could die. So when we read John chapter 11, we are seeing the humanity of Christ. You see, Jesus has friends. We need community. Amen, somebody. It's one of the hardest lessons for me, uh, just individually, uh, I don't like people around me. <laughs> when I'm going through, I want to be by myself. Don't talk. Don't, don't, don't. Just let me alone. Just let me get in a little hole and let me be by myself. That's not healthy, and I realize that, so I'm not telling you that's healthy. I have and am trying to process and learn that as well because there's strength in people. The Bible tells us that in the book of Ecclesiastes, two is definitely better than one. Now, you can't trust everybody and you can't hang with everybody, but every now and then God will send you some solid folk. Come on, somebody. Some real people who know how to pray you through. They're not going to beat you down when you're in trouble, but they're going to encourage you and they're going to pray you through. I need those kind of friends in my life. A friend who is born for adversity, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs. Not somebody who is a fair weather friend. You're my friend when I'm on the mountaintop, but when I had to spend some time in the valley, you left me. When, I was in, when you saw me at my ugliest, when you saw my mistakes and my failures, uh, you, you couldn't stay with me. I just That's the, not the kind of friend that you need. Now, I'm not talking about offense. Some people are very offensive, and you just got to get away. 
But Jesus had friends. You see his humanity here. And you, so to set up the text, uh, Bethany, where Lazarus lives, and the place that Jesus was, you got to look in Ch St. John chapter 10. It's about 30 miles, about here to Starkville, Mississippi, or a little longer. Uh, you, you can see the distance, but they didn't have cars back then, so to walk that distance would have taken a little while. So you find here in the text the humanity of Christ, and, and just bear with me for just a few moments this morning as I attempt to teach and explain some of this. You see his humanity and you see his love for his friends. You ever had a friend? Anybody know what I'm talking about? A friend that you love. All right. <laughs> a friend that loved you. A friend that was not looking for anything. That's when you really know who you have in your life. You love me when you don't need nothing. Some folks show up when they need something and they love you because they need something. You got to pay attention to how people are with people, with other people. You got to pay attention to how people treat uh, people who clean the building. Come on, somebody. The janitor at the school. You got to pay attention to the folk and how we treat individuals. Because it's, an, it's a testimony of our character. True people of God treat everybody the same. If a multi-billionaire walked in this building right now, you park with everybody else and you can sit out here with everybody else. You don't need a special seat. You don't need a raised platform. You don't need anything special. James actually talked about that to us. God is no respecter of persons. Now you go in church, they want to see your W-2. You go in church, we want to know what your salary is. And you get seated in a lot of churches based on your importance. God is not in that because all of you are important to God. If you got $1 in your account, if you don't have no account, you're still just as important to God as somebody with millions. And you got to see yourself that way. Lazarus Imagine being a friend of Jesus, though. Not a friend that would be more loyal. You could go to Jesus and be honest with him. I'm upset today. I messed up last night. You're not worried about the next day Jesus telling all of his other friends what happened to you. He wasn't worried about his name coming upon uh, social media and uh, the, 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 your name being used as mud and people to walk all over you because when you're a friend of Jesus, you have a true friend. Told us here in the text that Jesus received word that Lazarus was sick. Now notice this, Martha and Mary are the sisters. The indication may be that Martha was the oldest sister, and I want you to notice this because it's important. If you look at another text in the Bible, you can remember Mary, the other sister, was always at the feet of Jesus. I love that about her. Martha, at one text, I think it's in Luke chapter 10, 11, and I may be off on that, but uh, there was another text where Martha was serving Jesus. She was fixing food and she was serving tables. And all that time she was working, Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus. Martha got mad and said, I'm feeding all these people and she in here just sit down at your feet. Jesus said, basically, you're going to have to leave Mary alone because she's in the right posture. He said, sometimes you get so consumed in what you're doing for me until you forget this is the posture that I need you to be is sit seating or sitting at my feet. Because that is the posture of worship. That is the posture where you laudate the Lord and you're saying you are great, you are everything, and I'm nothing. Another text here in John chapter 11 Martha and Mary send word to Jesus. When Jesus finally gets there, I'm going to skip ahead and then I'll bag back. So just hang on for just a moment. Uh, Martha is the one who meets him. She is running to Jesus and she tells him, listen, if you would have been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. Man, that's quite a statement to tell Jesus. If you would have just showed up. 
We could have canceled the funeral. We could have canceled everything. And here you are showing up late. But when Mary hears that Jesus has entered into the outskirts of Bethany, she does the same thing she knows how to do. She finds Jesus and she finds his feet. And she, she said the same thing, but her posture was different. She said, if you would have been here, Lord, Lazarus wouldn't have died. Keep looking in the text. How important the situation was. Typically, to us, everything is an emergency. Y'all know I'm telling the truth right there. You ever had a friend that panics all the time? And you have to constantly, hey, just, just calm down. Just That's kind of how we are when we go through something. We, we get, it's, it's important. It's about me. It's about now. We are like that, all of us, whether you're young now or you used to be young. We were like, you have multiple children. Uh, you feel like your need is important and more important than the others. Amen, siblings. I was talking first. Talk to me. I, it's what I have is vital, and I need you to listen to me. And that was the mood. That was the mode. Jesus hears this information, and he says, this sickness is not unto death. I'll get to that in a minute. That's our text. He says, this is not, gonna, this is not the final of all of it. This is not the end of everything. And then Jesus tells them, listen, Lazarus is asleep. They were so confused. He said, oh, well, if he's asleep, Lord, he's okay. And he just... Y'all been with me all this time, and y'all don't get it yet. That's what he was saying. He said he's dead. He finally just said, y'all, Lazarus is dead. But here's what I love about the text. Martha and them, they sent an emergency, some messenger or something. They couldn't text. They couldn't email, whatever we had today. And the Bible says when he heard the information, he waited a couple of more days because he says, what I'm going to do is for the glory of God. This is where you got to get this text this morning. Not everything that happens bad to you is because of something you did. Oh, Y'all hearing me right there. The mindset of people is when you go through trouble, he must have done something wrong. Because there's no way good people go through. Hence, karma. Sanctified folk don't believe in karma. Come on, somebody. People who believe in the Holy Ghost, we don't believe in karma. People who believe in the Holy Ghost. Now, we know whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. But we take in that scripture out of context. Because some people are saying, now, if you do something wrong, if you kill somebody before you got saved, I'm sorry, you're forgiven, but you're still going to jail. You can speak in tongues in your sentence. But you're going down for what you did. You don't, we don't get away because we're saved now. But what I am saying is this. Uh, Jesus loved her so much and he loved them so much. He says, I'm going to wait a little while because there's something bigger at play. Something in your life, in my life, typically we rush God because we want the outcome to come early. I want you to fix it now. I need you to change it now. And God, because he knows all things, God doesn't just know the past. He knows the future. If you don't believe me, read the book of Esther. I find it interesting. You will not find the word God mentioned in Esther. All of those chapters, not one time will you see the, the name God in the book of Esther. But you know he's there. It's funny, but here's the thing I love. One queen named Vashti, she was rebellious to the king, and the king dismissed her. The whole while God had something in play, he said, I'm going to raise up Esther to be the queen because there's a plot to kill the Jews. 
And because of that plot to kill the Jews, I'm going to work months in advance, years in advance to set something up because I know the past, I know the present, and I know the future. And there was a young man by the name of Haman who had a plot. We're going to kill Mordecai and we're going to kill all of the Jews. But guess what God had? He had a plan. <laughs> he had a plan. He said, all right, Mordecai, I'm going to take your cousin because Esther's mother and father had already died. She had an older cousin named Mordecai. Now, I'm going to say a whole lot of stuff. You just got to run with me for a minute. She had an older cousin who became a father to her. Well, God was working as in her life when she was a child because you can't see everything God is doing and there are some events that took place in your life. That's why the Bible says everything is working for your good. The good is working for your good. The bad is working for your good. The insults are working for your good. Every time they talk about you, it's working for your good because God's got something at play. I want somebody to get excited. I don't mean shout, but in your spirit and just have an anticipation. Say, I know I'm hurting right now, but God is working on something. I don't know what it is, but God is working something out. He has something better for me. Then the Bible says, Jesus waited. Some of it, what we go through is self-inflicted harm. We just got to be humble enough to take that. Job went through, but it wasn't because of his sin. His friend said, yeah, you did something wrong. Because nobody loses their children, loses all their money, and gets sick. And they hadn't committed no sin. But God had already said about Job, I love Job, and he's the most righteous man in the East. It's not about, I heard one person say it this way, it's not about what they call you, it's about what you answer to. And if, if any lesson that I've had to learn person in my personal walk in life is that lesson, because people are going to call you everything, but what are you answering to? So, he waits two days, and I'm, I'm getting to it, y'all know y'all saying, hurry up man, get to it. He waits two days, he finally leaves. He's headed to Bethany. He gets there. Martha comes out. She said, if you had been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. What's so amazing about this story is that Jesus had already raised a couple of people from the dead. You know, Jesus didn't do right when he went out. You couldn't take him to a funeral now. He, he couldn't be around death. He go to a funeral and interrupt it. Y'all can go home now. They out. He would call the person out of the casket and they would get up. I mean, you can't have a funeral without a dead body. But when he raised the other individuals from the dead, if you read the gospels, they had just died. Some of them had been dead for a couple of hours. The widow's son at Nain, he went to the funeral and tapped on the casket. The boy got out of the casket. Jairus' daughter, uh, Jesus, she had just died. He goes in and he raises her from the dead. But Lazarus had been dead for four days. Now what's called decomposition had begun to set in. His body had begun to rot. His body had begun to deteriorate. They had already had the funeral. Jesus would, Jesus would raise people from the dead before the funeral. Lazarus Jesus came after they were done with the repast. And when Martha sees him, she is a little frustrated. We called you before he died. We called you when he was laying on the bed, when everybody was there and you didn't show up. And you got the nerve to come here after we done fed the guest. We at home and we're just relaxing. And then somebody comes in and says, Martha, Jesus is here. Now, if she was from the south, she probably rolled her eyes. Oh, he going to show up now. He didn't 
come into the city. He was on the outskirts of the city, and she goes out to meet him, and she said, if you had been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. And Jesus said, Lazarus is going to rise again, girl. She said, well, I know there's a coming resurrection in the, in the future. Well, all the dead are going to rise. And, she, and Jesus looks at her. He said, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. I'm going to close right there. <laughs> I am the resurrection and the life. I mean, that, that's what he's, he said. He said, listen, you, you're looking for an event, but the resurrection is a person. And his name is Jesus Christ. And, and, she, and he looks at her and he says, do you believe this? She said, yeah, I believe you're the son of God. Nobody spoke of resurrection. Nobody thought Jesus was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. They had, catch this, um, let me be deep, watch this, watch this. They had accepted the tragedy and they had accepted the situation as final. How many of us in this room or watching have accepted your situation as final? You've accepted the bondage as final. You've accepted what you're dealing with, the struggle with sin, the struggle with whatever it may be. Well, this is just what it's going to be. It's final. They go tell Mary, and Mary's in the house, and all of her friends are there. The Bible says the other Jews were with her, and everybody was in the house crying, and they were weeping, and they were mourning with her. And they said, Mary, Jesus is here. She goes, and when she gets up, the people get up behind her, and they say something that's important. They said, y'all, let's go with her. She's headed to the tomb. She's headed to his grave to cry some more. But she was going to see Jesus. She gets to the tomb. I mean, she gets to Jesus. She falls at his feet, and she said, if you would have been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. And finally, Jesus sees her heartbreak, and here's where I wanted to show you the humanity. He sees her weeping, and the other people weeping around her. And the Bible says that Jesus wept. The shortest verse in the Bible is St. John chapter 11, verse 35. Just two words. We used to say it for grace, Mario. Anybody, y'all old school folks don't know you young folk may not know that. When we were hungry, we didn't hop. Heavenly Father, thank you. You know, some people get all deep. Father, thank you for the chicken and the food. and all. No, man, just pray. Mario and I were so hungry, we would just say, Jesus wept. And we'd dig in and eat. And we didn't have the foggiest idea what that verse meant. But it's, it's, it's loaded with so much information. They said, Oh, he really must have loved Lazarus. Look at him. He's weeping. He's crying. But they didn't realize the reason he was crying. Yes, he loved Lazarus. He was crying because he saw the picture of humanity. And that everybody in this room, me, you, all of us, no matter who you are, no matter how healthy you are, how fit you are, how pretty you are, how tall, short, whatever it may be, we have a common denominator, and it's called sin. And because of that principle, the law of sin and death, as Paul said in Romans chapter 7, which is in my members, the Bible says that it's appointed unto man once to die. We're counting down to the grave. Sadly, that's the reality, and Jesus saw it, and there's no picture that depicts sin like a funeral. He's weeping. The Bible says he's groaning in his spirit. They can hear him groaning. They can hear him weeping. He's visibly crying, and in his emotion, in his heartbreak, and in his tears, he tells Mary and the others, he says, take me to the tomb. Jesus, Lazarus has been dead for four days. I don't know if you knew that. Take me to the tomb. And as he's walking with the group, he's weeping and he's crying. And he gets to Lazarus' tomb. And, and I love this part. When he gets there, 
the Bible says that he tells the people, roll the stone away. Now, at that particular time, what graves were, were they were tombs. They would cut out the side of a mountain. They didn't have plots like we have today, and they would put that body wrapped in grave clothes. They would put the body or the corpse in the tomb, and they would roll a large stone in front of the tomb. And so Jesus comes to the tomb, and the first thing he does is he prays after he tells them to take the stone away. You got to remember, unbelief was in the crowd too. Wherever you go, there's going to be unbelief there. And the unbelievers were murmuring and talking under their breath while they were headed to the tomb. And they were saying, didn't he open blinded eyes? Ain't he the same one that unstopped deaf ears? Well, all he had to do was come. And if he would have come, Lazarus wouldn't have died in the first place. Let's use our vernacular. Now, he's talking about how much he loved Lazarus. Well, if he loved him, why is he dead? Lord, if you really love me, why are my finances like this? If you really love me, why did the doctor diagnose me with this? If you really love me, why did I have to lose my mother? If you really love me, why did I have to lose my friend? If you really love me, why did this tragedy happen in my life? And that's the trick of the enemy. He wants you to blame God for what's happened in your life. And some people today, please let me minister to you, are walking around angry with God right now because of something bad that happened to them. I've had people to say, well, how could you serve Jesus and, and believe in God with all the evil in the world? Because they blame God for the children who are sick. You can drive over to Memphis, Tennessee right now. St. Jude Hospital is filled with babies who have cancer. God help them. And some people are blaming God, saying, how could there be a God? And this happened. I was listening to the late Chadwick Boseman, who was the actor from the Black Panther movie. And while he was battling cancer, he was filming the movie Black Panther. He said there were two children who had cancer who told him, we watch you every day. And we just want you to finish the movie. He broke down and began to weep, and I was crying too. I ain't going to lie, man. The older I get, the weaker I'm getting. I don't know if it's God or what. When I was a kid, I never cried. And I, every day, I'm, last night I'm in the bed, just, Lord, help me. I'm just, it's, I, I thank God for it. Softened my heart. Lord, I was so callous and just, you know, my kid would fall, bust head while I'm dead serious. Daddy, you'll be all right, boy. I didn't realize how messed up I was. But I'm weeping because he, he said they were dying. And by the time the movie came out, those two little boys had died. The coach for the Boston Celtics right now, he, uh, they were asking him about the game. And, and, you know, everybody got caught up in sports and the NBA finals. And he said, let me tell you what my life is. He said, there are, I saw two children who were dying with cancer and they were celebrating. They were dancing and they were having a good time. And he said, you're asking me about a basketball game. He said, that's what life is. Not this basketball. I got mad at God back in 2017. I had had my fourth knee surgery, and I was just getting frustrated because I said, listen, I'm, I'm 35, 36, 37, and I'm deteriorating like this. I'm angry and I'm mad. I wasn't coming to church, and I was pastoring. Oh, y'all ain't ready for that truth kind of not the past. I was mad. And every Sunday morning, I would get up and just try to turn on church somewhere and just try to get a word. But I was so mad. And I saw this infomercial of these babies. They were dying with cancer. And God spoke to me. He said, you're complaining about a knee. And these little girls are dancing. And they don't have but three months to live. Because we blame God 
for the problem, every problem that comes. But I want to tell you some of the tragedy and the tragedy and the heartbreak and all of what happened to you, God was using it. And he's turning it around. He's making something out of nothing. He's, God is the best general contractor. He's the best architect. Because God sees filth. If you don't believe it, go back and read the book of Nehemiah. Brick by brick, Mario. When they went out, they saw rubbish. Uh, the, the people, the enemies saw rubbish and burnt stones. But Nehemiah had faith and said, God's going to use these burnt stones. And we're going to rebuild the house of God. We're going to clear out the rubbish. And that's what God is going to do to you. He's going to clear out the rubbish in your life and use what was burnt and broken and thrown away. And you will be like a brand plucked out of the fire. My God, he's going to make something out of you. Just don't quit. While it's hurting. That's why the enemy tries to make us feel like there's no hope. That's why suicide seems to be the only out for a lot of people. Because the enemy wants us to feel hopeless. Jesus in his weeping and his crying, he says, roll the stone away. And Jesus prays. He said, Father, I thank you. Notice the text that you have heard me. Jesus had already prayed, but he prayed publicly so that the people could hear him praying. He wasn't showing off. He wasn't saying, look at me. It was the time now that they were going to see that God does answer prayer. He said, Father, you always hear me when I pray. And look at what he said. If you don't believe me, he said, but I'm saying it now that they may believe that you sent me. Because what's about to happen is going to blow their mind. What's about to happen, they are not prepared for it. Oh, they've seen blinded eyes come open. They've seen a deaf ears get unstopped. They've seen people get healed from some stuff. But what's about to happen now is happening after the funeral. What's about to happen now is happening after the repast. And everybody's gone home. And now Jesus says, move the stone. They move the stone. But before they move it, Lazarus' sister said, Jesus, please listen to me. He said, she said, Martha said, Lazarus has been dead for four days. She said, the stench of his dead body is horrible. You got to see the miracle. She said, he's stinking. We don't want to see our brother. Jesus said, I thought you said you believe me. When you have faith, that means you put it in God's hand. The problem with me and us is we can't let it go and fully put it in God's hand. Because it's so ugly, I feel like I got to do something to try to fix it. Because my, my, my child is not saved or my, my son is doing this or my daughter is doing that. My, my daddy is not saved. My mother is not saved. My family, my grandchildren, my grand, however it may look. And sometimes it looks so ugly because they're bound by drugs, bound by alcohol, bound by perversion. Some are bound by demonic spirits. They're worshiping demons. Talk to a brother I was preaching in Virginia, and he, he, he came to the truck as I was leaving. He began to sob and, and just weep and cry. His daughter, who used to be saved, is now a witch and worshiping the devil. And he read a text message that she sent me, and I'll never forget that day. And he just cried and cried and cried. There are some people that we are connected to who have some real problems. I'm talking about some heartbreaking stuff. This was his baby girl who was singing on the choir, who was worshiping Jesus, and now she had lost her way. And he said, brother, no matter what, I'm not going to blame God. He said, I'm going to believe God for my daughter. And he's still standing on the word of God. And I'm standing with him. You don't have to know her name, but stand with her. It stinks. It's hopeless. It's over. It's over with. 
Been four days, Jesus. You might well go on back to Beth, wherever you were, just go on back. He said, move the stone now. See, nobody really knew who he was. But they were about to find out. Like the day David showed up, the little shepherd. David wasn't just a shepherd boy. He was a cute shepherd boy. What you mean he was cute? The Bible says he was handsome. He was cute. He was a little red-headed, cute boy. And he was out tending to the sheep. So when they saw David, he was just a pretty boy. He was just cute. He just tended to the sheep. He has no power. David showed up there, and everybody was afraid of Goliath, and he had the audacity to get a slingshot to a 10-foot-tall giant and five smooth stones. David's brother said, man, go home. David walked up to Goliath, and Goliath said, who is this little pretty boy that y'all sent out here? David said, Goliath, when I get through with you, everybody here today is going to know that there is a God in Israel. Come on, somebody. You ought to give God praise. They're going to know that I didn't come in the name of David. I didn't come in the name of Jesse. I didn't come in the name of anybody else. I came in the name of the Lord. My God. He came and he said, roll the stone away. They rolled the stone away, and I, the Bible says that Jesus looked over, and as he prayed to the Father, he cried with a loud voice. Here's why I get happy. And he said, Lazarus, come out. And I could see the silence, because the funeral was over. They were at the place now where all they were going to do was just visit the grave every now and then. The food was gone. There was no more tea, no more Kool-Aid, no more greens, no more chicken. They had gotten their to-go plates, and they were going on home. All of the, the, the crying and the weeping was still going on. And Jesus shows up, and he said, Lazarus, come forth. And there was a silence. Wait, 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 wait. It can't be. It can't be. Because it's dark in there. If, if he come out of that tomb, I know something. Because if I was there, I mean, let's be real. You And, and you had unbelief there. The, you know the twisted look. Well, you know that man been dead four days. He's not coming out of that. If you don't believe it, we'll get to it in just a minute. Because if you read the latter part of the chapter, you will see in that group there were unbelievers. Lazarus, come forth. Why did he cry with a loud voice? When Jesus, you got to remember, when Lazarus died, his spirit and soul left his body. So in the tomb was nothing but a, but a body. Before the cross, when people died, they went into a place called Abraham's bosom or paradise. They were captive in some way because the cross had not been a reality yet. So when Jesus calls Lazarus, this shows his humanity and it shows who he is as God. He had to call Lazarus by name. I'm going to give you a moment to think. Because he had power over paradise. He had power over death, hell, and the grave. Because you remember when they were trying to crucify him, he said, I could call legions of angels now and shut it down. I've got access to all of glory because I am the king of glory. I am the, oh my God, I am the Lord of hosts. He said, you remember when Zachariah said, and the Lord of hosts, he said, that was me. You remember when David said, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and the king of glory shall come in. He said, that was me. Do you remember when the psalmist said, he's the great shepherd that was me so he had to call him by name why because if he would have just said come forth everybody that was dead would have came out of that grave 
Somebody got a shout in here right now. Come on, give God a praise right now. Because of the God that you serve. He's God. Oh, I can hear Brother Dudley Smith say, he's God on the platform. He's God in New York City. He's God in Tennessee. He's God in California. He was God at Bethany that day. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus comes out of the tomb. But he got grave clothes on. He can't see. His legs are wrapped up. See, somebody, God brought you out, but you're still struggling. Huh? You're still wrapped up a little bit. You, you're alive, but you're acting dead. You've been quickened and made alive, but you still got grave clothes on you. And then Jesus looks at them and he said, loose him and let him go. I feel that in my heart right now. This sickness is not unto death. They said, but he died. I know he died, but he's not going to stay dead. Oh, it hurt me, but it didn't kill me. Oh, you, you, you knocked me down, but it didn't kill me. Oh, you kicked me, but I'm still alive. Somebody got to. Man, if I can get somebody in here to praise God with me, I'm telling you right now. Hallelujah. I got the diagnosis, but I'm still alive. Oh, somebody, they gave me the pink slip, but I'm still alive. They fired me, but I'm still alive. Somebody give God praise in here. I'm alive. I'm a, somebody shout, I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm alive. You talked about me, but I lived. You lied on me, but I lived. You betrayed me, but I lived. You left me, but I lived. My God, and because he lives... We can face tomorrow. Give him praise, give him praise, give him praise. Hallelujah. Now I'm trying, I need to calm down because this ain't, di we ain't being dignified in here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But I keep thinking about it. I keep thinking about how he saved me. I keep thinking about how he raised me. I keep thinking about how I should have been dead. I keep thinking about, and I can hear Brother Lee Williams say, I am a living testimony. I should have been dead and gone. Somebody got to praise him. Here. I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm alive. Hallelujah. I'm alive, Brother Gary. It should have killed you, but look at you now. Still here. Still praising God. Still rejoicing. I'm alive. Somebody shout, I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm alive. I lived through it. I lived. Hallelujah. 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 Grab your neighbor by the hand. I'm sorry. We're just going old school. Grab them and shake them. Shake them and grab them. Grab them and shake them. Shake them and grab them. And tell them I lived. I lived. I'm still here to declare the goodness of the Lord. Give God praise. We're not having church as usual no more. We're not holding back no more. The gloves are off. I'm going to praise him like I lost my mind. If you thought I praised last week, you ain't seen nothing yet. I'm alive. Shut up, Ohosa. Hallelujah. 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 I know I'm not supposed to be here. I know I'm not supposed to be here. I know you're not supposed to be here. Bug, you're not supposed to be here. The doctor says she can't make it. She won't survive a delivery. But God stepped in. God stepped in. Because something bigger was coming. My God, Asia, the same testimony. The doctor said it's hopeless, but she came. I wish I had a praying church. Hallelujah. 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 
That's why I'm praising. That's why I'm shouting. That's why I'm rejoicing. That's why I'm happy. That's why I'm singing. That's why I'm dancing. That's where my praise is from. Because I live through it. Pray, give God praise in here. Stand to your feet all over the house of God. He walked out of that tomb. The Bible says many people saw him and they believed on Jesus. But other folks saw it and they went and told the Pharisees, this dude down here calling folk out of the tomb. True story. Read the rest of chapter 11. They got so mad. They should have been rejoicing. But they were plotting to kill Jesus. They said, no, nah, uh-uh, we're going to have to kill him. Because he caused in too much of an uproar. And by the time you get to chapter 12, because your story is not over yet. By the time you get to chapter 12, Jesus is sitting down in Simon the leper's house having dinner. Mary, here she goes again. She's at his feet, washing his feet with her hair. And you won't believe who was at the dinner. Lazarus. You better, come on. No grave clothes. No sickness. Man. Nothing. He didn't even look like he had been dead. Because when God promises you something, you got to hold on to it. It may look hopeless, but if he said he's going to do it, I didn't say if I said it. I said if he said he's going to do it, then you can rest on it. Hallelujah. Yeah, glory. He promised Elijah. Look at the text. My God, I feel like preaching in here. He promised Elisha because Elisha asked God. He said, I want a double portion of the anointing that's on Elijah's life. God said, I'll give you a double portion. But what always blows my mind is that God said, I'll give you double the miracles. But before Elisha died, there was still another miracle left. And Elisha died. And it looked like God didn't keep his word. But they threw him in a tomb. And while his bones were in the tomb, the Bible said that the Moabites came by. And one of their men had died. And they took the dead body and threw it in Elisha's tomb. And would you believe it? When he touched Elisha's bones, life came back to his body. That's the last miracle. Somebody shout. There's still another miracle. There's still another miracle. Hallelujah. 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 If you believe this morning, I want you to come. If you're hurting this morning, I want you to come. If you're fighting in the spirit this morning, I want you to come. If the devil told you you weren't going to make it, just come around this altar. This is going to be a shout of praise, victory, expectation because of the God that we serve. Sometimes we fought so much against false doctrine. And we have to. And there, there are people who have misused the word of God and misused the word faith to where we are scared to talk about faith. We're scared to rejoice and believe God for what he said. But saints, we got to stand on his word and believe him. Our God is still a miracle working God. He's still a miracle working God. Father, we love you today. We thank you. Lift your hands. If you're online and you need a miracle, if you're in this room, you need a miracle. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. But believe today. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, help us to rejoice for life. Help us to rejoice. We are alive. This sickness is not unto death but it's going to bring you glory. We know sickness doesn't bring you glory. Death doesn't bring you glory. Sin doesn't bring you glory. But Lord, healing brings you glory. 
Raising the dead brings you glory. Forgiveness of sin brings you glory. So in the ugliness of the situation, Lord, help us to believe you that this thing is going to bring glory to you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you and we praise you and we give you glory and we magnify you. We honor you. And Lord, we thank you for every person in this room. If you're here today and maybe you're disconnected from God, maybe failure has taken over your life, you feel defeated in your mind, you feel defeated in your heart, you feel defeated in your spirit. When am I going to get the victory? He paid for it 2,000 years ago at the cross. And because of that, we can have victory today. Stand on the word and believe the word and trust in what he already has told us in his word. And thank him today and rejoice. Lord, we thank you right now when we believe you. We trust you. And we glorify you. And we honor you today in Jesus' name. I want you to encourage somebody. Put your arms around them. Thank God for what he did on yesterday. Women, come on. Come on, sisters. Give God praise. The testimonies. Some of you, that's your testimony. I'm alive. I lived to encourage you. I lived to tell you what God did for me. So glad I made so glad I made it. I made it through. Come on. I made it through. So glad. So glad I made it. Let that be your testimony. So glad I, I made it. We're going to be here Wednesday at 6 o'clock. Find you a neighbor. Find you a visitor. Find you a friend. And just encourage them. And say, hey, we're going to make it. We're going to make it. I made it. So glad I made it. So glad I made it. So glad, so glad I made it. Think about the darkest hour of your life, the lowest moment of your life. Some of us escape suicide. Some of us escape depression. Some of us escape.